Support the Amigos podcast on Patreon or PayPal and receive cool perks and rad swag. Visit our page at everythingamiga.com slash support. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today, Aaron, we're going to be talking about Operation Thunderbolt. Aaron, Sounds have, like you a ever, Bond flick. have you ever been part of a covert operation before? Well, it was covert to us, but yes. Tell me about we it. We called it Operation Dive Through the Phone Company's Dumpster. Okay. And uh, that involved some sneakery, uh, getting around fences. No, uh, no. Let's 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 break it on down. First of all, yeah, please. Who gave you the idea to do this? Uh, <laughs> it was my idea. Okay. Yeah. Um, I and who had, was involved uh, in this? Um, it was me, uh, my buddy Rich. Uh, there was a chick there whose name I've lost, and I had. Uh, really been getting into the phone freaking mm. uh, back in the day. This would have been, oh, geez, 88, let's say. And uh, we thought it would be awesome to get all the secret hidden knowledge that our local AT&T store had in their dumpster. Now, is this the AT&T uh, we, store in, um, in, in Tays Valley there? Well, this was the, it is. But it, at the time, this was a... Uh, this store was just on Taze Valley Road, and it wasn't a store. It was actually just a, a branch of AT&T. Okay. Uh, and I want to stress that we were posers and had no idea what we were doing. And I don't know what we planned on finding, to be honest with you. Uh, and But uh, we dug in. We pulled a bunch of uh, paperwork out of there. And <clears throat> I remember sneaking it back to my buddy's house, who was my – I just had a loose knowledge of this guy – uh, but it was he lived with his mom. I don't know where she was, but he spread out a bed sheet, and we just dumped everything we found on the sheet. Wow! And I and I remember look surveying the scene, you know, and I thought to myself, we us three are morons. <laughs> we have went through because you're looking at coffee grounds and stuff, and you just I was just like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. And it wasn't the last time we did it. We did it several other times. What were you uh, hoping to find? I don't know. So there was never a, like, man, if we just could stumble upon the blank, we'd have something. Correct. We, I, I don't know. Maybe phone numbers or equipment. You know? I mean, I, I, much like almost everything in my life, I knew just enough to be dangerous, both. And, and that's what I was. Dangerous to myself and others. Uh, and so I think we did this one or maybe two other times. And then once we had this huge mound of garbage that was, and trust me, when you get the, 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 the paperwork we got from the phone company, it wasn't like covert phone numbers or, or even credit card numbers or anything. It was just, it was real stupid stuff like inner office, uh, uh, rules and, and dress codes and, uh, uh, you know, billing, you know, crap. Mm. It was crap. It was a waste of time. But it was under the cover of darkness, and that's about as covert as I ever got. I think was the uh, was the dumpster locked? Did you have to do any jimmying? It wasn't locked, but the gate into it was locked. Mm. So we had to sort of believe it or not. I crawled over a fence <laughs> and crawled twice. I can believe it. Eighty-eight Aaron yeah. could have done it. And I will say, we also pulled the same gimmick on a GameStop, which was this was several years later. Uh, because I'd heard about all the great stuff that they throw away, mm -hmm. and uh, this was also stupid. They, they the, what they threw away was about a, a lot of wet garbage, and literally. <laughs> and it was I don't know what was in there, but I didn't want it. Mm -hmm. You know, what about you? You ever do anything covert, Bo? You've done a, you've done you've been on a lot of crazy overseas missions. What have you done? Probably the most covert op thing that I did was we'd heard from people that played disc golf at OU that yeah. there were thousands of discs on top of the athletic center, which is like this, uh, you know, the fancy word for the gym. Mm -hmm. And so um, we borrowed a ladder from the French horn professor. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. And we carried the ladder thusly. Um, my buddy had a Jeep, okay? And we put the, the ladder on the Jeep on the roof, and then we reached out the windows and held on to the ladder on the roof of the Jeep as we drove through <laughs> town, securing it. <laughs> wow. This, this, the the uh, danger level goes way up in your story. <laughs> so we, we wait under under cover of darkness and yeah. we you know we, we unload the ladder what seemed like several miles away from the target because we didn't want to be spotted, you know, <laughs> driving up to it. Yeah, so ladder. instead, we inconspicuously carried a ladder over an open field. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we set oh, the ladder man. up against the gym, making probably the loudest sound that's ever been known. Yeah. Climbed up to the top and discovered two discs. Two. <laughs> two discs. Still, at least you've got something for your trouble. Yeah, and I, and I had those discs all the way up until when I moved to Korea. And they were they were lost in the shuffle when I moved to Korea. But uh, that was as covert as it got. What uh, was your? Are these discs worth a lot of money, or did you guys play a lot of frisbee golf? What was the 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 pl- Yeah, the plan was to you know collect fifty or sixty discs and then just set up a table outside the golf course, saying, "Hey, you know, secondhand discs, get them while they're hot." Right. It was, a, it was a glorious plan. The name of the plan was Operation Pankow because uh, James Pankow is the name of the trombone player in Chicago. Fair enough. Yeah. Listen, that's the that's the geekiest covert plan I've ever heard. But at least <laughs> yours had you actually had some success, and you actually had a plan, which is more than I could say for my mission. Now I want to get back to your phone freaking just a little bit. Okay. So um, tell me about some of your greatest exploits as you donned the Captain Crunch mantle. Uh, well, let me tell you something. The closest I got to the Captain Crunch mantle was eating a bunch of Captain Crunch. All right, the cereal. The uh, I was like I said, I was a big time poser. You got to understand in the eighties when you're BBS and every bullet board you go to has tons and tons of this like hacking and fracking. And uh, that sort of explosives, all that crap. Mm-hmm. And so we had it all, especially since that stuff was usually free to download. Anyone that was around knows it was good trade material. But you'd, you'd accumulate. Let me tell you something. Back in the day, you had ratios, strict ratios on BBSs, and there were two things. There were really three things you could always use to up and up your ratio. It was hack frack and freaking stuff. That was one. It was porn, right? That was one. And it was just like generic pictures because pictures just as a, themselves was a commodity mm. you know Th- that was the lowest rung on the pole and then of course i mean that, that's not counting like software which you, you probably don't have uh, so i used to keep tons of this stuff around i've still got a bunch of it somewhere uh, but uh uh when you read this stuff enough you want to you think you can do it you know sure. and i actually did some things you know I learned to manipulate the Marshall's call out uh, stuff, but I did that for a while. And uh, I, I've made a few free phone calls. I was no professional, but I was, I, and it was, you know, it's a lot like that dollar changer story I told you. I got it to work one time. It never worked again. And I tried a thousand more times, <laughs> you know. So, I, but as a phone freak, you know, if you ever heard of 2600 magazines, like that, oh, yeah. that, all that stuff was had been around. But I had like, Ma Bell and all these like the real old school like newsletters. You got the letters, old communication. You know the old stuff from the old hack frackers. You know I think uh, Flack did some of this stuff in a much more uh, uh, successful way than I did. Now I knew people that were great at it. I had a guy that used to trade Coco software with me uh, in Jersey, or I think it was in Jersey, and he called me all the time through with a with using some sort of gimmicked up uh, phone freaking technique. And then he just went away one time. So I don't know if he, he got He went caught. away. He went to prison. Yeah, like we talked every day, and then he was gone. I never talked to him again. Mm. So I don't know what happened to him. So, but yeah, the extent of my uh, phone's freaking skills was about zero. But, you know, we tried. We wanted to be cool. We just couldn't pull it off. Well, that's the story, story of my life. life. Yeah. Aaron, we've had uh, quite an explosive week here on the site over at everythingamiga.com. Things have been moving. Things have been shaken. We have a new article to talk about this week that comes to us from none other than the intrepid field reporter, Pixels at Dawn. Yes, sir. He asked the question, when was the golden era for Amiga gaming? So 
this is something that I've often wondered. Um, you know, the Amiga was around, let's say, for a 10-year period, more or less, 85 to 95, let's say. I know, a little bit longer, whatever. Um, what year was the absolute nadir if you, uh, of the, uh, you know, software releases? And so what Pix did, this actually involved quite a bit of research on his part as he went over to the only centralized review database that we have in the Amiga community, that is the Lemon database. And uh, he took all of the reviews and uh, sorted them by uh, number, by rank, and by year and came up with the results. And so uh, I'm not going to give away all of the secrets of this, but let's just say that there was a three-year period right in the middle of the Amiga's uh, reign when it was most popular, uh, and it's sort of like a bell curve, sloping up and then down again. What's yeah. funny is uh, there don't appear to be uh, either, there were zero reviews from games from 85 or 86, or they were all zero <laughs> games. Now, I've looked at some of the games that were released with the Amiga in 85 and 86, and it, it stands to reason that some of those could have been zeros. There were not a whole lot of winners in those first couple of years of the Amiga. Now, there were a couple good ones in there, like Archon was in there. Yeah, Marble remember, Madness was in there. I remember doing that year-by-year year look at the first two or three years of the Amiga, but most of the early stuff was really, you know, by Amiga stage, it was super remedial stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, what's really interesting is he goes through and he talks about the uh, worst years of the Amiga. What <laughs> years have the lowest reviews? And what's funny is there is a similar kind of bell curve it's not as pronounced as the great curve but um there is a you know a five-year period sort of in the early to middle sections that that break down uh, you know the the worst games and um you know he posits the question uh do the best and worst years come from the years where the amiga just put out the most amount of software total you know and all the cream you know rises to the top and all the crap floats to the bottom what do you think about that aaron it's, first of all, this was a great article, and it was so clever. You know, uh, I, I've got to give him credit. I, I read this earlier today, and I was just like, I was enthralled. You know, I think, I think you're, I, you hit, you hit a lot of stuff with a machine gun more than you'd hit with a with a pistol, but your aim is not as precise. I mean, you've got to, like you said, it. I, I noticed that one of the years in the best and worst overlap. You know, I mean, big time. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you're getting there is just a huge girth, just a, a ton of releases. Uh, I, it's neat, though. You can really definitively look at the best three years. And then he even lists the software that was released in those years, the good stuff. And you could you could say, like, OK, yeah, I think you can see where things are going here. It is surprising to me. And, I, and maybe, Bo, I know how you are. Maybe it doesn't surprise you, but <clears throat> I was surprised that. In the later years, in the waning years of the Amiga, that like really, uh, uh, they didn't get a lot of big hits uh, uh, there. I mean, you know, they they're not they're and you would think by that time, where the machine had gotten a lot more uh, attention and ha had been worked on a lot, that you could really turn out some awesome stuff. But you know, it wasn't scoring with the Lemon crowd. Yeah. Now he he does have a little thing here at the beginning where he says like you know Lemon, it's a uh, you know grain of salt because uh, you've got but I mean. If, I think Lemon is like you said. It's the it's pretty much the the really the best of the uh, sites to use for re reviews, just because it's so established. It's been around for so long. But I really enjoyed this. I thought this was good stuff, Bode. Yeah, me too. Me too. Thank you, Picks, for uh, yeah. for for a really great article. Head over to everythingamiga.com to uh, check that out and all of the other uh, fabulous content that we have. We have so many good editors that are uh, putting out great articles uh, every week. Aaron, let's shift over to our YouTube channel. It's been a, a busy week here uh, in YouTube land. Yeah. Um, well, as we often do, let's start off uh, with the first thing that happened after last week's show, which was, bam, uh, ARG Presents, uh, the show me and my brother do. Uh, this this week, we actually sp spun a lock on the wheel, and we had a TRS-80 color computer show. Uh, we looked at two <clears throat> very different games. Uh, Rad Warrior and the Interbank Incident. Uh, I uh, really enjoy. I always enjoy the Coco stuff because we both grew up on it. Me and Brent did. Uh, but I was really happy this week to introduce people to the Interbank Incident, which I think sort of a uh, 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 u
point and click in every sense of the word. It supported the Cocoa Mouse. It supported the Speech Pack. It was hard drive installable. It was multitasking. Quite an achievement for the humble color computer. And then Brent's cartridge, I didn't realize that Rad Warrior had been ported to so many different machines, uh, including the C64 and the Apple, a bunch of machines. So it was I, I learned a lot about that. So we had a good time uh, messing around with this thing, uh, Boatster. But like I said, we always like Coco stuff, as you know. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, look at my shirt. I, I'm a big Coco fan. I was a late comer to the Coco, and uh, it, 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 it already won me over. <laughs> uh, it's it's a great system, and I'm always happy to hear you and Brent talk about the Coco because half the fun of, uh, of video gaming to me is listening to people's memories and knowing that you and Brent both grew up playing the Coco made this this one really special for me. Let's talk about another great, great, great machine, uh, Boatster. Uh, you went ahead and did one of your classic R. Sinclair uh, unboxing slash uh, spotlightings on the, what is this, Octagon Squared? Un- is that what the name of the game is? Octagon, Octagon Squad. Squared? Octagon Squad. squad. Yeah. I can't breathe, but I'm sorry. Tell us about this thing. Octagon Squad was a big surprise. I didn't know what to expect from this game, this is a Mastertronic release, and Mastertronic is known for their budget titles, which can be hit or miss on the humble spectrum. But um, you know, we we unboxed this when I read through the instructions, and when I started playing it, I was amazed at uh, just you know, this is a game that that has sort of a it looks confusing from the get go. You know, the interface looks a little bit strange, but once you get the hang of it, it's pretty fun. Um, you're, you're basically, I don't know if I actually accomplished anything in this game, but I had fun doing it and that's the important thing. And, um, so yeah, the Octagon Squad, this is another one of these R. Sinclair solos, uh, since we're, we're, we're not really recording the R. Sinclair podcast anymore, uh, doing these solo spots kind of scratches that itch for me, getting some, some good Sinclair action going. Plus gives me a chance to uh, look through our massive, uh, cassette collection at the same time. I love that. I think you've probably got one of the biggest... Uh, Amer- uh, U.S. Uh, Sinclair tape collections, there probably is. Oh, undoubtedly. <laughs> thanks to, undoubtedly. Thanks to our very, very generous uh, listeners. And we, we appreciate you guys. And we and the Boat's out there. Boat is one of these guys. He wants to play through every one of these, and he, probably he will eventually. Eventually. <laughs> can. Eventually. Boat, you also, you were on fire. Tell us about your Tandy Clark computer stream here. And I did catch some of this. So speaking, what, what is, speaking of my love of the Coco, uh, I decided that it was time. It had been too long since I'd taken the Coco 3 off its place of honor on the shelf across from where I sit now. And so I slowly slid it off its pedestal and brought it over to my TV for some hot Coco action. Um, basically what I did was I fired up the, uh, the SDC and I asked Curtis for uh, five of his favorite games to play. Because, you know, if you're going to ask anybody for game choices, Curtis is the way to go. Indeed. So started out playing some Digger. This is a new game that uh, is uh, was just released. I guess it's still under development uh, on the Coco. It's a I think lo- it was just released like a couple days ago. Oh actually. wow! Oh wow! Yeah. What what timing? Um, so you know, I played through this. This is a, a load runner type affair. Uh, very fun. Uh, and then I just went through and I, I played some other games. There was, you know, the the breadth of games on the Coco is is really. I mean, it's a lot like the Spectrum, and that you just there are so many different types. Every single game that I played was completely different from the one that came before it. We played a game called Photon, which was a puzzle game that was really fun. We even played a Doom, uh, a clone, or not. You know, that's not really true. A, a Doom like game, a first person shooter on the Coco. Aaron, can you Couldn't believe, believe it? that? I. I- I came in as you were playing that, and this is the game I'd seen before, and I almost fell out of my chair. I was—I could not believe the Coco was pulling this off. I mean, it, <laughs> very impressive. Yeah. I'll just say that. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I and so, um, anyway, I ended up playing Coco for much, much longer. I thought I was going to do a 45-minute stream. I looked up at the clock. An hour and a half had gone by, and I was ready for more. So uh, mm-hmm. if you want to sit back, relax, pour yourself a cold one, and, and watch uh, some, some different Coco games, uh, check it out. You know, not to – I hate to – of course, it is uh, Septandy, but I hate to keep harping on the Coco and the Amiga show, but I want to say this. You know, me and you have delved, in, delved into several – uh, European computers, stuff from the UK, and me and Brand have looked at some real crazy stuff. If if anyone in the in in the UK or Europe or uh, any of the other countries that are that where the Tandy wasn't a, a computer that was around, I mean, I know you had the Dragon Thirty Two, but even that wasn't really something that was 
that was really touched on all that much. If you want to kind of turn the tables and get into an American machine that even most Americans don't fool with, the Coco is is the machine for you. Like Boat said, it's very it's sort of it reminds me of R. Sinclair, <laughs> no pun intended. It's got a great library of games, and the Tandy is so easy to play games on the uh, that it's unbelievable. The, the price of entry is still pretty inexpensive if you get a Coco Two and the uh, SD reader. I highly recommend if you're looking for a niche, if you've got that itch to scratch in terms of something you're not used to playing overseas, this would be a great thing to import and fiddle with. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> Ask the Amigos, part one. Now, we really uh, got a lot of questions this time around. I had a real good time with this one, Boat. Uh, boy, I don't remember. We, we, we were asked so much stuff. I can't even remember what, <laughs> anything specifically, but we had a good time. Uh, if you want to hear me and Boat uh, answer questions for a half hour, uh, check it out. And if you are a member of our Discord, uh, you can leave us a question to answer in the Ask the Amiga section on our on the Amigos Discord. And we had a good time with that, didn't we, Boat? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about our good buddy, Jack freaking Flack, Boat. He has released a Sprite Castle Plays. Uh, and it is Laws of the West boat. I haven't got to see this one yet. It just popped up, and I was on the road. That, that, I, don't, I don't think we've ever touched Law of the West, have so we? So I know a lot about Law of the West really? because it is one of the favorite games of uh, Jeff Gersman, who's sort of my uh, protege in the uh, in the podcasting world. He's the host of Giant Bomb. And uh, I'm, I don't know if I'm, I think I'm his, his yes. he's my protege. I was blown away for a second. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really understand how words work sometimes. Um, anyway, okay. I really look up to Jeff Gersman, and this is one of his favorite games. Uh, so I've watched him play it. And uh, this is one I can't not, I cannot wait until the uh, the episode of Sprite Castle where Flax talking about this. I just finished his Load Runner episode as I was driving home today. Yeah. And um and Law of the West is so unique. I'm really really surprised the Amiga didn't get a version of this because this is just one of those classic computer titles. That's it's a mix of genres, uh, and it's 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 uh it's 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 pretty cool. So I'm really looking forward to uh to Law of the West. And if you want to watch it in action, check out Flax video. You know the uh, CDTV uh, got a very bizarre old West game, as I recall. I think me and Brick covered it. It's one of the stupidest games I've ever seen. And so I'm sure that whatever Flack plays is going to be better than what I played that day. Listen, but one more thing before we move off of YouTube. Tell us uh, what's in store for us on uh, This Week in Retro. So This Week in Retro uh, just came out uh, this uh, today. And uh, we talked about a whole bunch of things, Aaron. We talked about the new C5. Uh, did you know there's a new C5? I I had not. There's a brand new. Someone's making. Someone new. is making. Clive Sinclair's nephew, I think, You're kidding. is is making they, a new C5. Exactly the same? Yeah, or are they updated. No, no. I mean, well, I mean, it's it's going to be brand new. I mean, do you, they wouldn't let the original C5 out on the road today. I mean, with safety protocols and stuff, you got to you got to build them better than they did back in the eighties. Right. Um, we also talk about a console. If you've got an oscilloscope just laying around. Guess what, Aaron? Yeah. You can build a Vectrex clone and power it from your oscilloscope. Okay? We talk about that. We talk about the 35th anniversary Super Mario Brothers game and watch that uh, that uh, just dropped last week. Lots of people very excited about that. And uh, Sid Meier wrote a memoir. So if you want to catch up on the life and times of the creator of Pirates and Civilization, Silent Service, and more, uh, you can check that out. We talk about all those things, plus a bunch more. It was a really heavy news week for us at This Week in Retro. And breaking news announcement. This is the first time anyone has, has heard this in the world, including you, Aaron. Okay. Um, this Week in Retro has its own YouTube channel. We are going to be posting the episodes of This Week in Retro in full to the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. So if you have not yet subscribed, uh, just search for it. Uh, I am in the process of uploading all of the episodes. I think I just have the first two or three up. Um, but uh, going forward, you will be able to check out This Week in Retro not only in uh, on a podcatcher, but also in YouTube. Now on, on YouTube, they still will just be audio only episodes. Uh, we are not uh, in the in the video way, but 
Uh, if you like to listen to podcasts on YouTube, you will be able to going forward. So big news from this week in retro. Very good. And that, of course, that's you and Neil from Retro Man Cave fame. So Correct. That, that's, a, that's a very interesting show. I always enjoy. That's all I got on the YouTube boat. All right. Well, Aaron, it's been a big week for Amiga News, and we need somebody to introduce it. Where, where is he? Come on in. Not this guy. All right, Aaron. First up, this is a video that was sent to me from uh, the, the creator himself, Chris Edwards. This is an, a demonstration of Amiga OS 3.9 XL on Intel hardware. Okay, I wasn't okay. even aware that something like this could happen. So OS 3.9, this is not something I know much about. I've heard right. of OS 4. I've heard of OS Warp. Actually, that's not even an Amiga thing, is it? No, OS 2? OS, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> I don't know much about 3.9. Yeah. But um, this is, I guess it's also known as a Mythlon. And uh, it, it, I, I'm reading directly from the YouTube description now. It is the successful attempt from a Hage and partner in circa 2000-2001 to, to port Amiga OS to x86 hardware through emulation. So this was a chance for you in the early 2000s to finally run Amiga software natively. No, because it's through emulation sort of natively on x86 hardware. So I guess maybe this was way before stuff like WinUAE and, and, and stuff was around. I don't know. At yeah. any rate, it's always neat to see junk running on other junk that it doesn't naturally go with. And this is what that is. Now, Chris goes through, this is about a 30 minute video and he talks you through the whole install process and all that stuff. So you can check it out. I know there's a lot of hardware junkies. I know 10 marks in the in the chat right now. He's going to want to check this out because this looks like something that is directly in his bag. Is this is this brand new stuff here, Bo? This was published on August 27th, Aaron. This is brand new. Wow. I, I, yeah, that sounds interesting. So, yeah. Um, next on the docket. Now, this is something we also talked about in This Week in Retro, but I couldn't let it pass, Aaron, because oh, yeah. it does it does hit us close to home. This is an article by Keith Stewart, who is an, uh, a, a, uh, a a gamer of some renown, a programmer oh, yeah? of some renown, uh, writing for The Guardian, the 20 greatest home computers ranked. Uh, what he has done is taken, the, uh, in his opinion, the greatest home computers and ranked them from 20 to 1. Aaron, yeah. if you were ranking, we're not going to go through the all 20, you can you can check out Neil's rundown on that on on this week in retro. We're just going to focus I did on, read this. Yeah. on on the top five, Aaron. The top five that he has is the Apple II, yeah. the ZX Spectrum, the C sixty four, the Amiga, and the PC. Where do where the, do, you, do you think that that's fair? Is the fellow that wrote this a, a, a British lad? Listen, man, it's got the Spectrum on it. It's got the freaking Dragon thirty two. Well, uh, do you yeah. think he's British? Well, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know. I mean, I, he may be a great guy, uh, and he may have great credentials. But I, when I looked at this on, uh, they were talking about this on Twitter, and I buried this get this article. And the reason I buried it is, uh, it's, uh, you know, there's he doesn't post any criteria or. I mean, I, as far as I could tell, he just these are these are his favorites, not the favorites, his favorites. You need to put that in there. If you say they're the favorites, you need to put some sort of evidence as to why they're the all time. Listen, man, greats. I don't think you understand how clickbait works. Yeah, it worked great because I didn't read the article. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, no, I don't, I, you know. What I'm asking you is not to critique the article. I'm asking you the top five that he's listed here. Are these your top five or would you list different machines? Well, I, it's if, if I lifted the machines I like the most, then no. This okay. would not be my type five. So tell me uh, your top five. The machines I like the most, and these right? are computers, not consoles. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, would be the, uh, of course, the Amiga uh, would be there. Uh, the uh, Coco would be there because I love it. Uh, the uh, uh, I would have to say the C sixty four, absolutely. You know, uh, I don't like Apple, as you know, but you've got to put Apple in there. You got to. Uh, 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 and as much as I like the Spectrum and the DOS machines. Uh, it's a toss-up. You know, DOS won. 
So, I mean, they sort of have to be in there. And really, I'll look at the Coco and the Spectrum and the Amstrad and, and uh, maybe stuff like the TI. They're all sort of, they're great computers, but they're I wouldn't call them international successes like an Apple or a, or a DOS. PC or even an Amiga, you know, uh, to you know, or a C64. So I'm looking at this more from a, a, a global perspective. Uh, so it's hard to put like the Spectrum in there, or you know, or the Coco. Like I said, that'd be in my list, but it's not. It shouldn't be in a. I, I think it's. I think, think it's funny that you 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 claim that you're coming from a global perspective. I'm almost certain that the ZX Spectrum outsold the Apple II outside of the United States. Well. So your mm-hmm. global perspective is what every American well, says when they talk question. about the global perspective. Well, I never thought I'd hear, see you bury me for putting the Apple in the list. It didn't occur to me. You don't? Do you think the Sinclair is more uh, deserving of a top five spot than the Apple? Uh, no, I think they Two. both deserve. They both deserve to be in the top five. You Absolutely. Oh, they both deserve. Yeah. Well, well, let me hear your. Let me hear your grouping there. I gave you sort of a top five. Well, uh, the only thing that I would I would replace is I would replace the Amiga with the Atari. That's all I would do. Because the Atari computer was the it was the afford it was the first affordable counterpart to the Apple II. It brought the computer it brought the computer home to more people than the Amiga did. You're, uh, listen, I'm not going to fight you because I think the Atari, I think Atari's place in computer history has been uh, underserved. You know that people forget how long the Atari 8 bits were around. Yeah, just the sheer, just the sheer time they spent out there. Was I impressive. think that lots of people they 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 went from either nothing and and then they got they got an Atari. And then they got a C64 because the C64 was so cheap and the software was so plentiful, you know. And then they they basically just used that until they got a PC, and then it was over. You know, yeah. I did mention when I replied in Twitter that the all-time greatest computer ever made, and I don't think there's any disputing this, would be your Mattel Aquarius. Of course, I think we can all agree on well, that. Well, it's right behind the Exidy Wizard. That's right. <laughs> wow. Yeah, there you go. I don't know. I don't think there's any computer worse than the <laughs> having done the research on that show. That's one of the most ill-conceived computers of all time. To be honest with you, Aaron, if you rank the top 20 computers of all time, it's an easy job because there's really only about 20 classic computers. So all you're doing is you're taking an already existing list and just reordering it any way you know how. You so. Know, this it's was a brilliant rude. idea for, yeah. for, I mean, he talks about, you know, one of the things that Neil and I talked about was like stuff like the NEC PC-88. Yeah. So th- this was only sold in Japan, of course, you know, but, you know, there's a lot of people in Japan, even if it was only sold in Japan, it's possible that it still sold more units than the ZX Spectrum did just because there's so many people in Japan. I really don't know. I haven't done my research. So. I like the TRS-80 that made the list there. The, yeah, the, the Model One Hundred, probably not we, what we, they were thinking of. When that's our the all, I think that's the all time most popular ARG is where we covered that. I don't know why, uh, but we had a lot of fun with with, with that. Uh, I, I again, it, this to put together a, what I would consider a list that's not just your own personal opinion. I would have to see something that you did to make, you know, some some sort of criteria, you know. Otherwise, but I mean, everybody's got an opinion. Really, there are the top twenty or top fifty or top ten or whatever. It's just what you think. Yeah. You know, it's, it, and and but I think Atari is overlooked. I mean, I you know I agree with you on that. But I think Apple probably as much as hey, listen, it is what it is. I would put it in top five. All right, Aaron. Next up, we have a new video from the one and only Amiga Bill. Uh, he has released another interview. I'm sorry, not another interview. Another speech by Jay Miner. Uh, if you recall, a couple weeks ago, he released a videotape of Jay Miner speaking at a at a conference at some point in the past, and he's uncovered yet another speech. This one comes from Ami Ep- Expo in 1990. Um, you know, Bill really does a, a great job. This is a very sort of um, Bill thing to do. Instead of just putting it up a, a you know a um, a thumbnail and having the audio play underneath it. He, he hooks up a reel-to-reel tape recorder, and uh, he lets that play, and he's zooming in on various things. And th- this this is actually coming from that reel-to-reel. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, Aaron. I love the way this looks. I can sit here and watch this all day. I wouldn't even need to listen to the, the audio. I haven't got to see this yet, so I'm looking for I didn't know about this at all, so 
this, this is news to me. But yeah, I'll definitely check this out. Yeah, listen, <laughs> he's an award-winning like genius, and he's got panache at the yin yang. So yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah, no surprise that Bill does a good job behind no, the camera. No. Next up, Aaron. This came to us, and you know, every once in a while, I just like to highlight. People send us videos of their collection going through their collection, and this is what this guy has done. Bally Alley. Uh, he is. Uh, he is. He's going through his Commodore collection and talking about it, talking about his favorite games. This isn't anything special. It's not going to blow your mind, but it's just always nice to have new people coming into the scene, talking about the machines that they love and playing the games that they like. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that, that's what this is. Um, this is his. This is part five of his Commodore Amiga collection. Uh, this is the Amiga 1200 part one. So he's going through each of his machines, talking about his memories, going through some of his favorite games. Look at that monitor, Aaron. Is that a, is that a 1084? I can't quite see. I, it, I know you I, I can't say, see I'd like it. to steal his monitor stand. I yeah, like, I think that's tremendous. I like that. This I like awesome, that monitor though. a lot. Yeah, but I'll anyway, definitely check this out. I like this sort of thing. I like when guys just get intimate with their own stuff. You know, maybe no one cares, and sometimes maybe it's just awesome. That's what I like about it. So I'll definitely, I love that. Right, right. He is playing with a Genesis pad, yeah. which means that there's no doubt about it. He's going to immediately fry his machine. Don't let yeah. anybody know that you're playing with a Genesis pad. No, no, Valley it works Island. fine on the on the on the Coco or on the Amiga. No problem. It works fine. Okay, I use them all the time. All right, Aaron. That's going to do it for this week's Amiga news. Good it's stuff. It's time to move on to our Operation Operation <laughs> Thunderbolt. <laughs> like we're a couple doctors that'd be a dead patient right there <laughs> so opera you know this one uh do you recall who selected this one uh, yeah, yes this was roly this was roly this was this one struck struck me as odd uh did we i don't think we ever covered operation wolf did we no in fact show? i don't think did it get an amiga release it, it must have it, right it did yeah uh, so i was surprised to see this one pop up it really was uh and uh i have you know this is when I have played in the arcade uh, back in the day. Let's talk about the arcade first before we get into the Amiga uh, port. So um, this was a Tato joint back in the day boat uh, released in the arcades in '88. Uh, so this came over pretty fast. I think you know who knows they were moving at a pretty good clip uh, back in those days when it comes to porting stuff over. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a, of course this was the sequel to Operation Wolf which was a pretty popular uh, gun game. This is one of those gun games where the gun was attached to the uh, front of the uh, front panel of the machine, and you just sort of leaned over and put your arm on that sucker. And yeah, you did. It was like an Uzi or something, as mm -hmm. I recall, and you just went to work. Uh, Thunderbolt, up the ante, you got the two-player two player gun action uh, boat. Uh, of course, this got tons of ports, and the whole gimmick in this, this is, this is one of your classic uh, games of the era. Uh, if you watch the opening on this, and it's funny, there are differences in this between this and the uh, Amiga version, the arcade version, the Amiga version. And one of the things I saw right away, and I got this pointed out to me a couple web pages, is that in the opening, the whole premise of this game is hostages have been taken on a hijacked jet by mm -hmm. terrorists uh, to a fictional country. Now, in the in the uh, uh, Amiga version, and I think even in the European version, it actually tells you where the country's at. It's in Africa. And it even on the map, it shows you on the Amiga version, too, it shows you where it's at. It, it labels the map and tells you where the, the hostage are. In the American arcade release, the map was just blank. Hmm. Something else in the in the arcade version of this, when it shows you the little, uh, the intro, it shows you the two uh, main guys that you're going to be playing, and they've got these ID cards. In the Amiga version, they've got all the ID cards spilled out with all the wars they've been in and stuff. In the arcade American version, they all it says is like, uh, they, it doesn't say they were with the NSA or CIA or anything. It just says, like, I think it's naval operative is what they're called. So what you're saying so, is that the introduction on the Amiga version is a lot more fleshed out. It is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, well, I mean, I think they did that for sensitivity for you know, or something. Who knows? You, you just so think that, they, you know, most of the people playing this would be out in the United States anyway, so they wouldn't care? Yeah, who knows? Yeah. I mean, and, and I don't know about the European version, but I, I looked at the American version. Uh, in fact, I put these side by side and, and messed with them. So... In the sequel here to Operation Wolf, uh, you're, the main character from the original game is Roy Adams, and he's joined by another guy, Hardy Jones, who, who is described as his fellow in the arcade version. It's his fellow. And they're on, their job is to rescue these hostages. Uh, and, through, uh, and you rescue people by how? You're blowing the crap out of anyone that's anywhere near them. 
So that's pretty much the game. I mean, the arcade game, the guns are there. You go through, and you uh, guys jump in front of the screen, and you shoot them. You'll go through... Uh, all kind. You go through an, a mission where you're just walking towards a camp. Then you're going on a mission where you're trying to secure a jeep. Then you're on a mission where you're driving the jeep or you're shooting guys. It's they can put whatever they want in the background, but at the end of the day, you're just shooting stuff right. uh, over and over. Now, I believe Operation Wolf. I think b- both these games. I don't think they even use light guns. I believe this is on that. This had that crazy uh, gun on a joystick. Uh, shooting. There's, mm. That's why the screen's not flashing mm. uh, in the arcade version uh, because they didn't actually use a light gun. <clears throat> so, a lot of people, I remember when they first came up with light guns for MAME, people were all mad that they couldn't play this. Well, it's because this game didn't use a light gun, despite the fact that it had a gun. Kind of wacky. Um, so, when it was time to port this game, uh, they had plenty of takers. Uh, they had I mean, all the usual suspects, the Amstrads, the C64s, the ZX, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, PlayStation 2 ended up getting like, you know, like an emulated port of this thing at one time. They got, there was a lot of, a lot of the usual uh, ports. Uh, so let's take a look at specifically at the Amiga version, which was released in 89, two discs uh, published by Ocean, of course. And this was coded by a guy named John Brandwood. This is all he did, according to Lemon on the Amiga. The graphics are done by a fellow named Robert Hemphill. Again, this is all he did, on, uh, according to Lemon. And the music was done by Jonathan Dunn. Now, Jonathan Dunn did do other things. Adam's Family, Batman, uh, Rambo 3, uh, Bart, Bart vs. Mutants, uh, Voyagers. So he had some couple marquee titles in there. And the sound in this is music's okay. Uh, so... This is just like the arcade. You have one or two. They don't fool around with an option screen. They can just jump right into battle. You know, you, you can play one or two players. And you take the mouse and you move your cursor. You, know, you don't have a cursor. You basically move your shooting around the screen. Try to shoot the bad well, what, guy. What you, what you use is like your your bullet placement as your cursor. There is no right, right. there is a there is a cursor pickup that you can get. But you, laser point. You, you know, your... Uh, your it's hard to even know what what you'd even call because like you see your gun, you see the bullets explode against anything. You know, yeah. you see the little white sort. I don't even what would you call Let's that? Call Aaron? It bullet trail. Bullet but, trail. Yeah, that's now, a good. Yeah. Before we get knee deep into this, I like to ask just a couple things. Number one, Boaster, had you played this one in the arcade before? Or even seen it? This is before your time, probably romping and stomping in the arcades. I've seen Operation Wolf several times in yeah. arcades, even fairly recently. Yeah. I have never seen Operation Thunderbolt. It wasn't as well received, and I agree with you. It's funny. Operation Wolf does send, tend to still pop up occasionally. It's it's the darndest thing. It's one of those games. Now, did you, did you played so you. I'm assuming you played Operation. Oh Wolf. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. fun. I, you get in there with the gun, and the way that you look in through the sight and everything, it, it, it's an environmental experience for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, having not seen Thunder, I mean, this is basically almost exactly like Operation Wolf. Uh, have you played any of the home ports of, of the Operation Wolf? I don't think I have. I, yeah. If I have, it's only you know what I'm sure I have for the NES. I'm sure I have, but I did, yeah. it, it doesn't last long because it was a rent, big rental back in the day. Was that I remember that one one that we brought Brent would bring it home every once in a while we play it. You know, without without the gun, it loses something. Yeah. So having not played this before in the arcade what were your initial impressions when this thing popped into view what'd you think um i was initially struck by how good the graphics looked yeah Uh, i thought that the backgrounds and everything were drawn really well um i was impressed with the opening it wasn't just you know they didn't just throw you into the action yeah um and i couldn't get very far in it um i tended to die a lot uh so to see the full game i had to rely on the long play yeah. Um, when I did look at the long play, I was very impressed with the way that they've, I mean, they've tried to break up what is in fact just the same thing over and over by giving you a variety of backdrops. You're in a variety of vehicles. You're on the land, you're on the sea. Uh, that, that part of it is, was neat. So I'd say that my initial impressions, uh, except for the, you know, the core mechanic of the game were good. I, uh, you know, I sat down. And we should mention that, I mean, if you've played any of these games where it, 
it's first person perspective. You've got a gun. You're shooting at what comes at you. You're shooting at the projectiles tossed at you. In this case, it's loads and loads of terrorists most of the time uh, throwing knives or, or grenades or shooting at you or shooting missiles at you. Okay. And then sometimes they'll mix in some vehicles as well. Um, what you've got is, uh, is your gun and whatever power ups you can get including grenades, extra clips, and, and whatnot. And sometimes you'll get a first aid kit that'll heal your life. And, of course, the more you get hit, the more uh, close to the death you get when you run out of life points, you die. It's a pretty simple game. Uh, one thing that I was struck by, like you said, the, it has the full uh, teaser opening. It's got, it, it, it comes up, it tells you the whole backstory. Like I said, it, 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 the funny thing is the Amiga version is more thorough in the telling of the backstory than the arcade version in America. Uh, and then... You are uh, you go in with one or two players, two players simultaneous. Uh, it, when you play these this game, it, I was struck much like you without having a pointer, because if uh, growing up playing this stuff on or you know playing this stuff on Mame, where they sort of grafted mouse into the games that play light gun games, you're used to having that cursor to shoot at, and so it's a real weird feeling. It makes the game a lot harder. Mm -hmm. uh, I, there's a, on my game uh, load up. There was a cheat file that let me permanently turn on the laser sights mm. uh, which basically what that means is you'll have a little red dot as your cursor right that makes it a whole lot easier you're like a sharpshooter at that point you could really uh knock guys off left and right um i thought the uh, I, I will say they kept the uh this digitized sound from the arcade when the guys speak because they're every in between every level there'll be like a shot of what's going on okay you've you've rescued the hostages now you have to get to the airport it'll say that they'll be talking you know there's music they kept all that stuff i mean it's pretty much right on line with the arcade which yeah is and, cool. and i was pretty impressed with the interstitial you know graphics and stuff like that it wasn't just one stage after another and things like that make a difference in a game like this especially in a game like this where the core mechanic is so repetitive having those little cutscenes in between the stages give you a reason to keep going yeah I will say, um, I sat this. I've got two monitors here, both. Uh, I've got the uh, Unamigo on one, and I've got my PC here. And I loaded up uh, the game on on my uh, Unamiga and on the uh, in my main, and looked at them and just and played them at the same time. And you're struck by the Amiga version in some ways is better looking than the arcade. Now, there's some big disadvantages that the Amiga version has in terms of graphically. And the biggest one is the scaling. Uh, Tato's uh, operation at Thunderbolt has a, a a scaling that comes into play, and it and it's a good, it's a cool effect for you know for back in the day. And the Amiga doesn't have it, or just doesn't use doesn't use what it has. And so on the Amiga version, you'll notice that the the uh, when you're going forward in like a 3D way, things aren't scaled; they just sort of move. You know what I'm saying? In the arcade, they're more scaled. But in a lot of ways, uh, the Amiga version looks better than the arcade does. Uh, it's funny to look at the actual, uh, the bad guys you're shooting, some of the vehicles. They actually are, look a little crisper to me on the Amiga version than the arcade version. They just don't have that scaling. Mm. Um, I thought the sound was pretty much about the same. Uh, th this game, though, as I played it, uh, one thing the Amiga version doesn't have that the arcade has, but not, and the arcade doesn't have much of this, is variance in your enemies per level. Uh, you'll go through many levels where you'll shoot the same exact man hundreds of times, uh, and he'll pretty much be the only guy you shoot mm -hmm. on the level. It's just the same terrorist over and over. And, of course, the, the one or two or three terrorists they have in the game will just keep popping up uh, over and over. I'm guessing you probably noticed this as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you can't and miss it. What, what's it's it's very humorous when you start to think about it. Like if you just think about this guy as being just the same guy getting killed over and over. My favorite of the vehicle stages where he just drops out of the sky for no reason. Like you're going seventy miles an hour in a jeep, and this terrorist drops out of a helicopter above you, only to be run over <laughs> by your jeep. I mean, what's the there's, life of these guys? There, that that happens a couple times. There's one there's one level towards the end where the uh, the terrorist are shooting you in the front of you. And then they, they will pop out. I guess they're hanging by their legs upside down <laughs> out from the ceiling. And I'm like, and you're shooting these guys over and over. I'm just, like, I mean, I, you almost feel bad for the terrorists. They're you do. So, you do. It's so stupid. They do just drop out of the sky on the level where you're driving in the boat. They just flop. Like, you're like, where did this guy come from? He just flops out of nowhere. It's the darndest thing. 
I was thinking uh, when I was playing this earlier, boat. You know, uh, a couple weeks ago, me and me and Brent on ARG presents, we did laser disc games, right? This would be the perfect candidate for the laser disc treatment because all you would have to do is digitize one guy True. and then just put some video behind him, and that's your game. I mean, you would be perfect for that. I agree with you. Uh, I, I, which, to a certain degree, I mean, if you look at the laser, the later uh, gun offerings. Uh, that came out uh, th- pretty much they were all the sort of, they you went with the Mortal Kombat style digitized graphics mm-hmm. on those and you could get away with that in games like this because there's so little uh, movement and of course it, and these games have always had the same problem just having the same guys over and over they you know uh, m- newer games would would add an additional dozen guys to this one, but they would still basically the same well, thing. Well, here's the way that I see it. I see that this is just part of an evolution where you start out with games like this and Operation Wolf, and then the next step up is a game like Lethal Enforcers. And yeah, that's like yeah, the natural I evolution agree. of this game. And then you go beyond that, and then you get into something that's a, a big step forward, like Area 51 or Time Killers or something like that. So you had to have Operation Thunderbolt. It had to be there so we could get to the the the, the upper rungs of the ladder later on. Now, I found out some interesting kind of nutty trivia about this thing, Boat, and about across the board here. So for starters, <clears throat> um, on in uh, February of 91, Operation Thunderbolt got put on that infamous German uh, list, mm, the no-no list. Right. Uh, so you, you don't want to get on that. Uh, which I wasn't terribly surprised. I mean, listen, the, you know something else that's funny about this? I want to think. Well, I mentioned this before I forget. Occasionally, an animal will run across the screen. Mm-hmm. All right, and you saw these, right? Yeah, the cats. And, and, and it, it's a cat and dog. Mm-hmm. And and uh, and I see like there was something else. But if you shoot it, you'll get a, a like a goodie. Yeah, they right? encourage animal killing in this game. Well, no, the funny thing is, if you watch the animals, don't die. Yeah, they, they just, just keep, keep on, going. It's like and they shed myself, they shed an ammo clip and then just continue their yeah. journey. You know, I thought to do. myself, it's like this is a game that will literally let you kill hundreds of men, but they will not let you kill an animal. No, <laughs> never. Like, it's very strange, and this is this sums up humanity in a nutshell to a certain degree. It's it funny. does. Animals it does. are a funny thing. Um, so get this, both uh, the C sixty four version of this, the port. I had to mention this because it's so nutty. It was written from scratch in two weeks. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, Two, it says here, two rookie... I found a whole page devoted to this game, so I got a bunch of juicy tidbits. Uh, two rookie programmers spent six months working on a version, uh, which just was jacked up. It looked great, but it didn't hardly play. And so, uh, <laughs> basically, they some guys came in and knocked this thing out in a two-week span. Pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, something else that was mentioned is that the plot of this is very similar... Uh, to the Lockerbie tragedy of '88, which with the, which was a hijacking disaster, I thought that was kind of neat. I saw someone in the chat mention this, and I, just as we were sitting here talking about it, in the clouds on the driving uh, stage, they said there were they were they said those were kanji. There were dirty words in the clouds, be, spelled out in kanji. Now wait a minute. Is that something that you read on your page? I just, or you, no, you, I just saw. Okay, it that, that you need to you need to monitor the chat because he said he just made it up. Oh, okay. Thank God. Well, that was awesome. Yeah. And the funny thing is, he, look at the clouds. It did look like candy. That's why. Right. I, that's I, why he said it. That's why I was clever. Something. See, that's a that's a clever boy right there. Um, I uh, I ha- I really went back and forth on this game boat. Uh, when it comes to playing it, I think I think it's a very good version of the arcade game. All right. I just don't think the arcade game is very good. Yeah. Uh, and so what you've got here is something that's not that fun. Uh, to me after a while. And so what I did was where you went through and watched the playthrough, I just basically, uh, I just basically turned on the cheats and mm-hmm. just went and killed my way to the end. Uh, and it got real, even with all the cheats and unlimited everything, it was, it got boring. As well, hell. I mean, it's going to get boring if you have unlimited everything turned on. That's well, the case of you, in this kind of game. Even if you don't trust me, it's going to get boring. Uh, cause I got pretty far in this before I got killed. You, it gives you a couple of, li- uh, Gives you a couple lives before it ends the, the game. The thing that I don't like about this game is there's just there's so much of everything all the time. Like there's so many enemies, and you constantly have to fire your weapon all the time just to see where your where your crosshairs are because that's the only way you can see where the gun is. So you're constantly running low on ammunition. Now you do get replenished ammunition fairly often, but that doesn't stop you. You Of course, in a game like this, you have no defense. There's no dodge button in this game. It's not like a cabal or something where you can run out of the way. So these types of games are 
not my favorite. I mean, they're not I, even good to port. No, no, it, and it, it's a it, shame played. because this is one of the best looking. I mean, just on the face of it, it's one of the best looking Amiga games. Like everything looks really, really good. I mean, the colors are, are really sharp. Everything is drawn well. You know, there's good yeah. music. It's just a shame that it's on such an awful game. Well, you know, it's it's of course it's. It's it, they they had plenty of time to make stuff look good because they only generated two or three guys, so they can make it look great. But they look the two or three guys look awesome, and the backgrounds look good. Like I said, it, it, it trumps the arcade in a lot of ways. But this is a game, and the and Operation Wolf was the same way that was built from the ground up to separate you from your quarters. Like all these gun games are mm -hmm. unfair. You know, they're always overwhelming you. You never see a hot shot player come in and beat this on one quarter. No. You know, you don't hear about that stuff. This isn't like a Donkey Kong or something. You're going to pay. Uh, and so when you bring this home, they 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 brought it home. And so, you, you know, you're you're faced with trying to beat this with, uh, you know, and have fun with it at your house. It's just not one that plays well at home. I agree. I did enjoy it more with, you know, because you could turn sub, you could turn like only the cur the uh, laser sight on. So you could sort of like semi cheat mm -hmm. and maybe have a better time with it or have more success, you know. But even st like I said, after a while. You can only shoot the same terrorist 600 times. You're just like, okay, move on. And the levels are also really long. Yeah. And when I say long, it's not a good way. I mean, you're talking, the levels are basic comprised of like, I don't know, let's say 10 screens worth of stuff that you scroll a thousand times. Mm -hmm. So you just see the same stuff over and over. It's like cheap animation. They just use the same backgrounds. They just roll over and over. Like we're watching right now, uh, there's a bit where you're driving towards an airplane and I mean, I don't know where this airplane's parked, but this is the <laughs> longest runway on Earth. There's an even more ludicrous part where you're in the airplane and you're shooting terrorists that are in the plane, and you run through this plane for. I mean, this plane's like six miles long. <laughs> yeah, here it is. It just you just keeps going on and on. Uh, this was another level where I noticed that the, the arcade version had different sort of, that had different prisoners, mm. like more than one type of prisoner. And this. Uh, game you're in this particular level you rescue the same chick about 50 times right she just pops out so it's that kind of game but like i said I'm, i can't i can't kill it but i'm not going to praise it. it it was a, a noble port of a flawed game basically um i looked this thing up boaster to see what the uh the publications of the day thought of this bad boy uh lemon gives us a straight seven no more no less uh uh, Amiga Action gave this an 81. Amiga Computing gave it a 78. Uh, Amiga Format an 88. Amiga Joker an 88. AUI gave it a 71. CU gave it a 94. So you can see these. the 1 gave it a 90. So you're getting stuff somewhere between 78 and 90. So I would say that's a pretty... That's probably... I'm, I don't know. Do you think this is a C game or is this a little bit less than that? What do you think? But where would you oh, place it? Oh, yeah, it's definitely a C game because yeah, I mean, I mean, but it, I mean, it has no replay value, does it? I mean, all, in all honesty, no. And I mean, it's a C game because it does what it sets out to do. It doesn't yeah. make any false promises. You yeah. know, um, yeah. it just it just isn't to me. It's just not that much fun. If you, so. if you were a fan of Operation Thunderbolt, then this is the game for you. Yeah. I, I should mention, and I haven't tried this, but I did confirm that it, it that it does work. If you get the WHD load of this, uh, there is a there is a setting that you can use to play this game with a Sega Photon, you know, gun. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so there is a, you can actually play this with a light gun. Someone went in there, I guess, retroactively added light gun support. I'm not Would really sure make... how that works exactly because yeah. doesn't the light gun I mean it works with screen flashing and there's no well, flashing I mean, in this game. It would, it would have to play on CRT and yeah. I, I presumably they add the flashing. Uh, I, I didn't try because I don't have I don't I do have mm. one of those guns now I'll think about it, but I don't have a CRT TV hooked up to this I, thing. I, yeah I'd like to see that in action. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, I, do you think do you think that would make this gun better with a light gun? I mean, it probably would. Oh well, yeah. I mean yeah. why it definitely would be better with the gun. Everything's better with a gun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Clearly, that's what the people that made this game thought. <laughs> Did you get any Discord action on this thing, Boatster? Absolutely. We got a lot of reviews this week. Uh, let's start things off with Chris Folds. He says, My thoughts on this game can be summed up by the following sentence. No gun, no fun. Without the gimmick of a gun, the dull, repetitive, and unrewarding nature of these types of games shines through. It may be a great port, but I didn't enjoy it one little bit. Three out of ten. Paul, a.k.a. Hermsky, writes, A herm-firm flop. 
Oh. Enjoyed watching the intro. Music reminded me a little of the Monkey Island panpipes. Interesting yeah. backstory to get you in the mood. But once the game starts, it was not my cup of tea. Found it repetitive to play. Watching unrealistic, bad, animated, cardboard, cutout-type enemies popping up like some kind of budget shooting gallery. Maybe more fun with a gun, but overall, I would have been disappointed spending my spoon doolies on this back in the day. 3 out of 10, although if I had a gun, would make it a 5 out of 10. Jason Warns writes, Grueling, 5 out of 10. Graham W. Vebke writes, Ocean did a good job with what they had to work with here, and it proves you can't make diamonds from clay. To say I had more fun the following morning after a dodgy vindaloo than playing this game is very accurate. Even with a gun in the arcade, this on-rail shooting gallery is just so utterly boring. If this is ever suggested again, I will spend time configuring my mouse and workbench instead. 2 out of 10. <laughs> Lord Soup writes, Aged badly and needs the gun. Arcade, 7 out of 10. Home, 3 out of 10. Rolo, Rolro, who chose this game, uh, suggested it to the Amigos Game Selection Committee. He writes, Operation Thunderbolt was amongst the earliest of the arcade versions I played on the Amiga. It was also a title I could make progress on. It was like a homily on the virtues of practice and application. Ensuring focus and positioning of the sights on enemies as the force scroll deliver them toward your relentless stream of fire was a manageable and predictable task. A reliable supply of munitions was conveniently and impractically, impractically delivered via airdrop. The only moment of hesitation was the episodically appearance of a ginger cat, and as I had a beloved ginger cat, any injury to said cat mandated contrition in restarting the game. Operation Thunderbolt seemed fair and rewarded iteration and practice. The decision on making when and where to use the grenades, the slightly metallic sound on getting hits against the boss vehicles on the forward scaling levels, the cutscenes, they were spectacular to me at the time. In terms of gameplay, with modern eyes, it's very simple. And in a way, that's why I think it still works quite well. It tests reaction time and anticipation in ways that are extremely rudimentary. I think it masks what is fundamentally an evolved species of the old electromechanical shooting games. Despite this, such varied locales seem to stitch it into a narrative of sorts. The steady progress through outposts with light infantry or irregulars, clad in purple, though to through to the more sophisticated sites as you approach the rescue. Although the ocean conversions are not very strong, in retrospect, this was one of the examples that stood out as an exemplar of what the Amiga could manage. Pixels at Dawn. He writes, I loaded this up with some trepidation, but I was pleasantly surprised. The intro was nice, the music was decent, and the sampled speech was pretty great, especially for yeah. 1989. Getting into the game was promising. It looked pretty decent, not arcade perfect, but then I started to run into problems. With no crosshair, it was difficult to target enemies, but I soon got my aim in and was able to easily shoot enemies. Unfortunately, they were relentless from the start, and level 2 just increased the number. It was just too much. The massive difficulty wall killed the game for me, even after loving the similarly difficult predecessor on Spectrum. I know, however, that you can play two-player games with two mice, so I want to give this a go on Amiga Live. Ooh. Fun while it lasted, but just too darn hard. Five out of five. That's going to do it for this week's reviews. As always, if you are a member of our Discord uh, uh, channel, we invite you to leave a review for the game we play each week. We love reading them. I, uh, before we pop out of this one, I did look this up on eBay, Boach. Mm. So, just for fun, uh, so, so if you want the disc only, it's under six bucks. You can get them in the USA, by the way. Uh, and if you want a boxed version of this, uh, you can get it for 16 bucks in the UK, uh, US dollars, and you know, give or take. Uh, if you want the JAMA board for this, just for fun, I looked it up, and because these things were mega cheap back in the day, mm -hmm. uh, two hundred. I saw one sell for two hundred seventy five bucks, and cow. one for four fifty. Wow, that's sold. The marquee is going for twenty five bucks. If you want, here's the funny thing: a working, uh, in completely in working order cabinet sold for eight hundred dollars. So there you go. We're but gonna cash out one of these days, Aaron. Yeah, We're sitting on yeah, a gold man. mine. You know, someone mentioned this, uh, that, and I agree with it. This is one of these titles that was, you know, the 80s were full of these games where you just sort of fight these nameless, faceless terrorists and bad guys from these mythical countries. 
you know, I can say without hesitation, I, th- this this crap doesn't fly with me anymore. I just get I just get kind of, you know. It, well, you the, still the you still enjoy a good round with the bad dudes. Well, yeah, you're right, but I mean, I don't know. They're not shooting guys, I guess. That's I mean, they're stabbing them. Granted, but it's not. I don't know. It's just not the same. But this game, this title, I I don't think I'll be going back to it anytime soon, unless I get a light gun, uh, and maybe then I'll give it a whirl. Well, Aaron, before we wrap up the show, we do want to thank all of the fine folks that make this show possible, including our Twitch subscribers. Uh, if you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you can subscribe to the show for free through Twitch Prime Gaming. Help us out a little bit. Uh, we want to thank Old B Sturgeon, Roshi MSX, David Moto Wylak, Jost80, Christian Russell, Jigglebox, Real Joe the Zombie, Frodo and L, Go to Go Sub, Still Adolescing, Mitsuyama, Pixels of Dawn Gaming, La Mazda, Wing Chun Wolf, Chris Folds, Macintosh Librarian, Uber Scuba Diver. Byte, Linux, and Retro Jerry. Thank you guys so much for supporting us through Twitch. Thanks, y'all. Now, Aaron, uh, last week's Patreon Song Challenge, I know I said this last week, but this week, even more so, the most responses I think I've ever gotten for a Patreon Song Challenge. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> more people are listening to and and more people have gotten used to your golden tones. Oh, and before we get into this, I do want to thank once again Rollro for uh, choosing this game for the Amigos Game Selection Committee. Uh, your uh, choice was much appreciated. And he he could write some he could write down some words. He does. I was nervous reading his review. I was afraid yeah. I would screw up his perfectly manicured uh, prose. I hope he grades you. I hope he does too. Last week, Aaron, the Patreon song was Take My Breath Away by Berlin. That's what that was? That's two words, Berlin. Like Your Burl Your performance Ives. of that took my lunch away, if you know what I mean. Pixels at Dawn got it right. He was right out of the gate with that one. Lobsterminator right behind him. Then Flack, Frodo and L, Gary Heather, Jigglebox, The Slow Norris, Richard P.S. Bomb the Bass, Paul, a.k.a. Hermski, Zorglub, Mitsuyama, Jonas Rulo, Chris Folds, Eric Nelson, and Andy Craig. All correct. They're all winners. Congratulations, guys. You got it. You a big Berlin fan, Boat? I couldn't tell you another Berlin song Listen, to save my life. if you're going to cover Berlin, we want to hear you sing Riding on the Metro. That's their big tune. Is that the Ride, Ride, like- Ride on the Metro? No, it's not that. Mm. Um, we got a new supporter this week, Aaron. A new a Patreon supporter. Oh, yeah. His name is Heavy Systems, Inc. Now, he spells Heavy Systems in all caps, so it really should be Heavy Systems, Inc. He almost went cool guy style. We he went big him. guy style. We welcome him with open arms. Welcome. He's already making a splash on the old Discord. Beautiful. So. Um, and we also got another Amigathon donation. They keep they keep trickling in, Aaron. You're kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nutmut, thank you for your Amigathon donation. You can still donate. Um, it's open until November $5,000 plus in counting for Children's Miracle Network Hospitals Amigathon.com Thank you very much, Nut <laughs> If you know this week's Patreon song send me an email at john at amigospodcast.com Please do not send me a message on Discord because I'm afraid that I will write it down I'll forget to write it down With email, I, I, I put them in a special place and I make sure that I don't lose them john at amigospodcast.com So I can announce you as a winner. Here we go. Heavy Systems Inc. Bundy Fraglo Cello Code. Mark by Lund, Olaf Hope, Hermsky Jonah, a.k.a. Simulant. Jeremy Jones, Ethan Little, Alien Breeder. Dave Velociraptor, Calvert Boy, Landon Sand, The Hudson, John Cook, Bomb the Bay Ace, Roshi, Roshi, Frodo and El Sol and Sazer Tech, Major Jug and Mr. Cola, Daniel, Williams, Bernard, Lucas, Jerry, Dennington, Zorg, Love, Commodore, Kid, Reflection, Simon, Ledge, Captain, Crispy, Kid, Lepat, and Kathy. <coughs> <coughs> G- 
Gary has a free lunch. K Fox, David Pickford. Cameron Armstrong, Andy Jones, Obsterminator. Timid Amigo, Retrocast, Bernard Quinn, Retro Man Cave, Tim Drew, Simon Rose, Joseph Harrison, Caleta, Rob O'Hara, Matthew Laramore, Andy Craig, Sean Zoe, Roland Burke, Andrew Monks, Joe the Zombie Leaf, Killan, Alec Bob Chicote, Level John Marshall, Matthew Perron, on Ricky DeRosha, Creepy Dead Boy, Figgy CTZ, The Slow Norris, Stefan Sorgard, Bortonson, Ed, Vin Helland, Blendo 75, Christopher Hassel, Ravi Abbott, Chris Falls, Dream, Catcher, Lauren Sheru, Graham Vebke. Adam Battersby, O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Gary Hucker, Paul, Bossman, Harrington, Duncan Styles, Tapes from the Crib, Josh Nan, Adam Bradley, Jonas Rulo, THT, Eric. Nelson, Kim Tommy Home Bush Dad, Daniel Bingston, Brutal Barracuda, Darren Coles, Jason Warns, Pixels at Dawn, and Kyobjorn Barman. You know, you know, while you were singing that, I was watching this game footage and pretending that all the people on the screen were trying to kill you before you could finish <laughs> singing, and it made it much more entertaining for me. <laughs> <laughs> For once, I want the terrorists to win. Aaron, horrible boat. I had no idea what that was. Next week, I'm sorry to say the time has finally come. We're going to be playing your favorite. You know, I always said if they had to name a game awesome, you know it's not. We're going to be playing awesome. Yes, finally, I'm on the board. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, selection committee. Thank you so much. So After I, you know, turned away again and again. Much like everything that you love and I hate, I've never actually messed with it before. So maybe I'll like it. You maybe can't I, maybe I'll turn hate the my corner. Stuff. That's not fair. Um. So uh. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome is next week. You but know it's good with a name like that, boat. We cannot leave without. Uh, saying a big thank you to all the fine folks in the chat right now. Oh, uh, and Frodo actually just put up a, uh, a message for all the Discord members, a reminder that the current Specky High Score Challenge ending September 18th at noon is Street Hawk. And Aaron, this week, I'm glad that Frodo mentioned this because we also have a new High Score Challenge on Discord. It is Pipe Mania. I've already put up my pathetic score. Uh, please feel free to best me, as so many, so many others have. Um, these high score challenges are a lot of fun. I tried getting Street Hawk working on the Specky emulator. It wasn't working for me, but some people helped me out with some files, so I'm going to try and give that another go this weekend, get myself a score up there. You know you're a big Street Hawk fan, aren't you, Aaron? Love, I love the show. It's so It's gleefully bad. You know something else? We almost went through the whole show and forgot, Boat. What's that? We are on the cusp. We are on the... We are looking 24 hours ahead. There it is. It's the International Computer Club. Oh, yeah. The debut meeting boat will be, in fact, uh, it'll be September 12th, and which is, as we're filming, this is tomorrow. Tomorrow. At 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. West Virginia time. West Virginia time. Uh, if you are interested in uh, participating in the International Computer Club, the debut meeting, uh, you can look for details in our Discord channel, Mark the International Computer Club. If you would just like to uh, set in the chat, uh, we will be streaming this on Twitch tomorrow. Again, this will be right around 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll go until it, we get bored, something fails, or we finish up. It's one of those sort of <laughs> deals. It should be a good time. Uh, we're going to have some people doing little... Uh, Demonstrations? Uh, that's right. And chats, and just we'll just, just kind of freewheeling it, boat, this yeah, first man. time out to see what kind of reaction we get. But it should be fun. 
and I'm we're looking, looking forward, forward to it. having a big crowd. Uh, this is tomorrow. this is shaping up to be probably the best idea you ha- you've had since since you since you came up with this this wacky show that we're doing. Well, so, you haven't seen it happen you. yet, Boat. I wouldn't. <laughs> please don't put it over yet because it may <laughs> it may self bury this time tomorrow. We'll see. We want to thank all of our users that are hanging out in the chat with us. You know, we do uh, film the show live. We're going to shift back an hour. We're going to start at 5 p.m. again because the school is back in session. And I got to get, get home Boy, from school. Boy, is it. <laughs> and so uh, I've uh, we're going to push the show back from our summertime start time of 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock. We'd love it if you could join us right here on twitch.tv slash Amigos Retro Gaming. Just like 10 Mark, Amiga 1200 Gamer, Arctic Cube... Uh, Awkward Aardvark, uh, Bitstorm, Brock101, Buck Owens, uh, Christian Russell, uh, Duke L. Hudson, Edvin Helland, Eeyore4077, Esme82, Frodo and L. Jigglebox, GoToGoSub, Graham NFCFC, Great Owl G, uh, Gun, Futsu, Hermski, Ian, Eltron5, Jason Warns, Clumpsy, L. Curtis Boyle, The Twarski, Mitsuyama, Olav Hope, Picard 2010, Pinguito, uh, Princess League, Remastino, Smash 1980, Taishinte, uh, Uber Scuba Diver, Vigoro Pros, and Z9K9. Thank you guys so much. Hanging out in chat. I love watching the chat go by as we record. Love all the little side conversations that go on during the show. It's always a good time here on Friday evenings with the Amigos. All right, Aaron, next week, it's awesome. Don't forget, if you're listening to this live or sometime tomorrow on Saturday, please join us right here, twitch.tv slash Amigos Retro Gaming, for the first meeting of the International Computer Club. We'd love to see you in chat. All right, guys, we will see you then. Until next time, adios. adios.